Hey everybody and welcome! Thanks so much for watching the pre-recorded presentation accompanying this session, Optimizing the Learning Experience of Neurodivergent Students for CLAPS 2020. Before we begin, I thought I'd give you all a little information about who I am and my background. So my name is Paige Crowell. I'm a teaching and learning librarian at Oxford College, which is part of Emory University in Georgia. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm a red-haired, white, feminine person. I am deeply interested in equity and justice in librarianship, but I am not an expert by any means. If I state or explain something incorrectly during this presentation, or if you want to discuss this topic further, please feel free to reach out to me at my email, scrowl at emory.edu. A note about terminology. During this presentation, I will try to use identity first language, i.e. deaf students or autistic students, rather than students with disabilities, as this is how I refer to myself, and it's more in line with disability rights scholarship. So our agenda for this presentation will be, firstly, a short background on disability and neurodivergence, followed by a discussion of universal design and universal design for learning, and lastly, I'll cover some advice from the literature on working with neurodivergent students. The script and slides for this presentation are available at tiny.cc slash neurodiv, N-E-U-R-O-D-I-V, if you prefer to follow along that way. Uh, and one more comment before we begin. My primary experience is working with undergraduate students. And this presentation is primarily geared towards librarians who do instruction and outreach with undergraduates. I'm sure a lot of this information is the same for those who work with postgrads, but uh, K through 12 librarians will likely have different experiences. I'm really looking forward to covering all of this in more detail, so uh, let's jump right in with some conversation about disability and neurodivergence. I thought it would be best to open with an understanding of how many disabled students attend undergraduate colleges and universities in the United States. In the 2015 to 2016 academic year, 19.4% of undergraduate students reported having a disability, according to the National Center for Education Statistics. This is a large list, uh, but just for clarity, uh, this number refers to students who reported that they had one or more of the following conditions. Blindness or visual impairment that cannot be corrected by wearing glasses. Hearing impairment, uh, that is deafness or hard of hearing orthopedic or mobility impairment, speech or language impairment, learning, mental, emotional or psychiatric condition, that is serious learning disability, depression, ADHD, or ADD, or other health impairment or problem. Now this number is particularly amazing because as recently as the 2011 to 2012 academic year, just 11% of undergraduate students reported a disability. So why the huge jump in just a few years? I haven't done the research, so I admit this is a speculation, but I suspect the rise is due to better awareness of disability among students, and therefore more diagnoses, less stigma around disability, though to be clear, stigma does still exist, and better support structures and accommodations for students with disabilities. As librarians, we are part of the support system that welcomes disabled students and helps them to succeed academically and personally in an environment that has traditionally been a hostile one. More and more disabled students will continue to enter post-secondary education, and we as librarians must be prepared to work with this population. Some valuable background here are the models of disability, which have been well described by disabled folks and their allies in the disability rights movement. Under what's known as the medical model of disability, disability is a diagnosis that needs to be cured by any means necessary. Accommodations make it possible for disabled people to function in quote-unquote normal society, but disabled people are disempowered and must ask for assistance to be included in a society that was designed by and for non-disabled people. The medical model puts the responsibility for overcoming barriers on the person with an impairment. Under the social model of disability, it is societal structures that truly disable people with impairments. Societal attitudes and barriers are the primary things holding disabled folks back, not their impairments themselves. The social model believes that society should be organized in a way that allows all people independence and opportunity, and accessibility for all is a matter of justice 
and equity. This is not meant to be a completely comprehensive representation of the experience of being disabled, but a way of reorienting thought processes around disability. Disabled people should not be adapting to society. Society should be structured to be more inclusive for everyone. As a side note, I really feel like academia could learn a great deal from the social model, but that's a conversation for another presentation. So these models are helpful to keep in mind when we think about the concept of neurodivergence. Neurodivergence refers to the diversity in human brains, in sociability, attention, mood, and other variations in human thought and behavior. The term comes from the autism community, specifically autistic sociologist Judy Singer, who uh, created the term in the late 1990s. For a while, it was mainly used to describe autistic folks and highlight that autistic brains don't function abnormally, but differently. However, over the years, its meaning has expanded out to cover many variations in thought and behavior. Some people object to its use because they feel it implies that there are no downsides to some of these conditions, but it's not intended to diminish the difficulty of adapting to a particular condition or living in a world that doesn't accommodate us. Autistic educator Nick Walker describes it as not intrinsically positive or negative, desirable or undesirable. It all depends on what sort of neurodivergence one is talking about. Many disabled people consider their disabilities to be an important part of their identity, but some don't, especially considering what the disability is. The neurodiversity movement does not object to consensual attempts to cure, for example, depression, but uh, they still most definitely would object to discrimination against people who are neurodivergent. <laughs> The term is merely meant to help us reconceptualize what we consider normative in terms of behavior and the workings of brains, much like the social model of disability we just discussed. For reference, the opposite term is neurotypical. Here I am using the word neurodivergence to refer to ADD, ADHD, autism, dyslexia, and mood, anxiety, and personality disorders. <laughs> Lastly, I've also decided to include this chart which I realize is a little overwhelming, <laughs> and I apologize for that, but uh, stay with me. I really am only going to talk about the top line of numbers here, but if you want to read the whole data table, please feel free to pause the video. I love this chart, even though it's unfortunately a little bit dated, as it's from the 2008 to 2009 academic year, because it highlights the percentage breakdown of student reported disabilities the National Center for Education Statistics reported. We can see that physically disabled students, those who reported difficulty hearing, seeing, speaking, or mobility limitations, make up about 15% of reported disabilities. Of those with disabilities, neurodivergent students, many of whom are not traditionally thought of and accommodated as quote-unquote disabled, are about 69%. It's our responsibility as library instructors to ensure that all students are served well by our instruction and we recognize that a one-size-fits-all approach especially fails historically marginalized students. Neurodivergent learners are not only marginalized, but all too often forgotten by academic libraries when they set out to address their issues with equity and inclusion. I believe that we should adapt to learners by meeting them where they are. Good instruction is accessible for everyone, and until we are meeting the needs of each student, we are failing all of them. When we're designing our instruction, keeping physically disabled and neurodivergent learners in mind is crucial for creating an environment that allows all students to succeed. This is why I feel our teaching should be grounded in the philosophy of universal design. So let's move on to how universal design and universal design for learning can be a useful framework for designing accessible library instruction. The idea of universal design began with architecture in the 1980s and aims to make buildings, spaces, and products usable by everyone, regardless of age, ability, or other characteristics. You can see how this lines up neatly with the social model of disability from earlier. In the late 1990s, the Center for Universal Design at North Carolina State University created these seven principles of universal design. Firstly, equitable use. The design is useful and marketable to people with diverse abilities. For example, a website is, that is designed to be accessible to everyone, including people who are colorblind or who use screen readers, employs this principle. Two, flexibility in use. The design accommodates a wide range of individual preferences and abilities. 
An example here would be a museum that allows visitors to choose to read or listen to the description of the contents of a display case. Three, simple and intuitive. Use of the design is easy to understand, regardless of the user's experience, knowledge, language skills, or current concentration level. Science lab equipment with clear and intuitive control buttons is an example of an application of this principle. Four, perceptible information. The design communicates necessary information effectively to the user, regardless of ambient conditions or the user's sensory abilities. An example of this principle is closed captions on TV programming. These are useful if you are deaf or hard of hearing, and are also helpful if you're in a noisy place like a gym or on a bus. Five, tolerance for error. The design minimizes hazards and the adverse consequences of accidental or unintended actions. An example of a product applying this principle is software applications that provide guidance when the user makes an inappropriate selection, or power tools with plastic guards to protect users. Six, low physical effort. The design can be used efficiently, comfortably, and with a minimum of fatigue. Doors that open automatically for people with a wide variety of physical characteristics demonstrate the application of this principle. And lastly, size and space for approach and use. Appropriate size and space is provided for approach, reach, manipulation, and use, regardless of the user's body size, posture, or mobility. A flexible work area designed for use by employees who are left or right-handed and have a variety of other physical characteristics and abilities is an example of the application of this principle. As you can see on the right, we have a comic and a there's a group of children who are standing outside of a public building. There's an adult with a snow shovel. There are some stairs and a ramp that lead from the building down to the students, and the adult is shoveling snow. There's a student in a wheelchair who says, could you please shovel the ramp? And uh, the adult with the snow shovel says, all these other kids are waiting to use the stairs. When I get through shoveling them off, then I will clear the ramp for you. And the student in the wheelchair says, but if you shovel the ramp, we can all get in. So you can see how this is a representation of uh, a ramp is a perfect example of universal design. So everyone can use a ramp no matter what their physical characteristics are. And if you have a ramp, then everybody is able to get in. Therefore, we have the caption clearing a path for people with special needs clears the path for everyone. So soon, educators of all kinds were applying these principles to their teaching practices. Universal design for learning is one name for this application, although there is also universal design of instruction, which is very similar. The main goals of UDL are multiple means of engagement to tap into learners' interests, offer appropriate challenges, and increase motivation. An example of this is having students practice research skills by finding resources that they will need to do a project, rather than having them all do them all research something arbitrary. Multiple means of representation to give learners various ways of acquiring information and knowledge. An example of this would be providing a choice to either read an article or watch a video on a topic, and both are equivalent in the information covered. And uh, multiple means of expression to provide learners alternatives for demonstrating what they know. An example of this is allowing students to either write a short answer response or record themselves explaining a topic for an exam. And uh, in this graphic, you can see that they have labeled multiple means of engagement, uh, effective networks, the why of learning. They have labeled multiple means of representation, recognition networks, the what of learning, and uh, multiple means of action and expression, strategic networks, the how of learning. So why should we as librarian instructors make use of universal design? I feel that Sarah, Sarah Maurice Whitfer phrased it perfectly. She said, libraries are, librarians are committed to social justice and care deeply about students, but librarian instructors often approach learners with disabilities as problems that need to be solved on a case-by-case -case basis. She goes on further to say that if librarians truly want to center disability, within the library instruction classroom, they must move beyond the legal dictates of accommodation and retrofitting, and instead design their classrooms as flexible laboratories of engagement and learning. Retrofitting your instruction the day of, because a professor forgot to mention a student's accommodations, is stressful, and it leads to ineffective teaching. 
The more flexible your instructional plans are, the more adaptable you can be, and the better learning experience you can provide for as many students as possible. Remember those seven principles from earlier? Though they kind of look like one, they're not a checklist. Disability Studies scholar Jay Dolmage reminds, recommends that we see them as a way to orient yourself when you're designing your instruction. Is this activity simple and intuitive? Can a student make a mistake at the beginning of this tutorial that will make it impossible to complete? Avoiding that will prevent frustration and dejection. Does this require physical effort of students? Is there only one way for students to learn this content? Is there a libguide or an asynchronous way they can view the content if they are unable to attend a class session? So this is not to say that UDL is a perfect be-all end-all solution to your instruction, just as the social model is not a comprehensive way to think about disability. Some UDL resources on the internet are certainly framed more as accommodating learning styles than accommodating disability, when disability should be centered for these discussions. As Anne-Marie Womack reminds us, our teaching should create a space that centers the experiences of disabled students within a universal design framework to create a more inclusive pedagogy. Dolmage also cautions that UDL can become checklist-based. I've got multiple means of representation, engagement, and expression, so this lesson is set to go. Uh, and it can make some strange appeals to pseudoscience in regards to learning, which I won't get into, but you're welcome to check out his work if you're curious. But overall, like the social model and the concept of neurodiversity itself, UDL invites us to reflect on what we consider good in lear learning and, and teaching practice how we share our knowledge with our students, and how they share their knowledge with us. So with a base knowledge of UDL in mind, I lastly wanted to share some specific tips from the literature on working with neurodivergent students. <clears throat> the most important piece of advice I can give is to keep an open mind. Keep questioning established practices and structures, keep thinking of new ways you can support your students, and keep learning and engaging with those around you. Many conditions and impediments are invisible, and you can never make assumptions about what a disabled student's needs will be. So make space for differences and make your teaching environment a flexible and welcoming one. <clears throat> Remember that universal design is never going to eliminate the need for individual accommodations, but working within the UDL framework will put you in a great position to adapt. And of course, patience and building relationships with students are always good foundations upon which to build your teaching practice. And building relationships with students, including them in the design process, can only make your teaching better. Womack says, in teaching, we might consider first how to include individuals typically excluded, how to make the normal more inclusive, but then also leave room for changes to be negotiated later. Of course, this isn't always possible for librarians who may only get one brief session over Zoom or in a classroom with students, which is why making normal more inclusive is sometimes the best you can do. But it's true that in order to understand how users with disabilities access and experience library spaces, services, and resources, we need to ask them. If you feel like you didn't provide the best experience you can to a student in a session, Invite them to come in for a one-on-one -on -one consultation and find a way you can meet their needs going forward. I also wanted to comment on intersectionality here. Alana Cumbier and Julia Starkey insightfully wrote that if we only involve white people with disabilities in our collaborations, for example, we will not develop approaches to access that respond to the different histories of oppression, contemporary microaggressions, and other practices that privilege some groups and assume the benefits of privilege that accrue for members of those groups over others. Remember that disabled students of color have had different experiences than disabled white students. Class, race, gender, sexual orientation, and other factors apply to the lives of disabled people just as much as they do to non-disabled people, sometimes in the same ways, sometimes differently. Never assume you know what a student's experience has been like. Invite them to share their needs with you and to do your best, and do your best to meet them if you can. Some wonderful librarians have written about their conversations with students on these topics, and I have compiled some of their tips that can serve as a starting point for all of us. There are many others out there, and I've included more in my bibliography than I could reasonably mention here. But I felt I would be remiss if I didn't point out at least some of the work that's being done in librarianship right now. Firstly, I've included some tips from James Cho, 
who works with autistic students through the Bridges to Adelphi program at Adelphi University. His tips are, educate yourself. Be proactive. To serve a population well, you need to understand its members, so it's essential to gain an understanding of the disorder and what life with ASD entails. Read personal accounts, speak with folks in your institutional disability office, and connect with students personally when you can. Outreach. As you'd expect, students are much more likely to seek help from a librarian they know or feel comfortable with. Autistic students may be less comfortable reaching out than neurotypical students, so creating a welcoming environment and spreading the word that you are supportive of disabled students is key. Teaching information literacy. Ambiguity, abstract thinking, and understanding audience and point of view is difficult for neurotypical and autistic students alike. Focusing on these topics may be especially helpful. Delivering this content asynchronously allows students to learn on their own time and at their own pace. Individual consults. No student likes being treated just like, an, like just another cog in the machine, and neurodivergent students are no different. Students desire personalization in support services, and individual consultations allow that level of personalization. Emphasis on information evaluation. Some autistic folks have difficulty with theory of mind, which is the ability to understand others' intentions and beliefs. If students struggle with theory of mind, they might have difficulty understanding others' motivations. Discussing how to evaluate authority in authorship or how authors appeal to different audiences may be especially helpful. Citations. Central coherence, the ability to pull information from many different sources in the service of a more abstract meaning, may be more difficult for autistic students. They may need help understanding when a citation is needed or how to paraphrase efficiently. Finally, of course, adjust to individual needs. As I've mentioned throughout, all students are different. Do not assume you know a student's needs just because another student you've worked with had that need. As we've just talked about, be flexible, keep an open mind, and meet students where they're at. I've also included here some of the ideas from Ted Chodok and Elizabeth Dolinger's Universal Design for Information Literacy. They developed this specialized framework in response to working with neurodivergent students at Landmark College. Some of their advice included, allow students to return to content with web-based course guides to reduce pressure during instruction sessions, use active learning methods that engage multiple senses, preview and review your lesson plan with a vocalized and written agenda, use simple language to describe concepts, avoiding library jargon as much as possible, decrease repetitive tasks, but do provide opportunities for more practice if students want it, and use student chosen topics for examples in practice. They give a great many more tips I didn't list here, but much of this advice lines up very nicely with the general principles of UDL, so I strongly suggest checking out their paper. Finally, I've given some of my own tips that I've gleaned from personal experience. These are very general thoughts, and I'm very much looking forward to hearing all of your tips as well. Firstly, be open to variations in social behavior. Students may respond well to group work, but they may want to work alone instead, and some students will feel much more comfortable this way. Prioritize working at each student's own pace. Stressing students who don't finish activities in class is not productive. Allow them to submit work to you later for feedback if possible. Allow diversity in speaking and communication. In class sessions, commit to listening at the beginning and respect it as a choice. Just because a student doesn't look like they're engaged doesn't mean they aren't absorbing the material. If you have a student who is very excited about class content and might be speaking over others, this might be a good opportunity to use breakout rooms or a think-pair-share style activity. What are your experiences meeting the needs of neurodivergent students? Please begin thinking about your own experiences prior to our synchronous session, and I'm looking forward to hearing what you all have learned. Whew. So thank you very much for listening all the way through this presentation. Uh, as I stated at the beginning, I am certainly not an expert, so I drew on the thoughts and experiences of many people to share this with all of you. I wanted to collect all the resources I found on this topic in a way that would be easily accessible. Uh, so please visit tiny.cc slash neurodiv, uh, N-E-U-R-O-D-I-V, to see my bi bibliography. Thank you again, and I hope to see you all at the synchronous discussion for this presentation on Thursday, September 17th, from 10 to 11 a.m. MST.
See you all then.